So, the layers of adaptive learning in a loop is that step level feedback that we give students as they're going through. And this is really where the intelligent tutoring system's coming. Um, it's probably the hardest to develop um, that, uh, because it is super context sensitive. Um, it's you know, taking that student response and giving a very um, direct answer. And that's kind of probably the most complex part of the layers of adaptive learning. And the middle loop, as I talked, is the, the item selection. After a student um, responds to a question, what question do we give them next? And then the outer loop, again, is where the subtopics and skills, what content should they work on in the first place? OK, so focusing on the inner loop. Um, OK, so probably the most difficult part with this is ideally you want to try and accommodate for the different um, student pathways. And it's probably best demonstrated by an example. Now, I'm going to try and hold on to my screen so it doesn't fall off the edge. I need to buy a thinner laptop. A bit older laptop, so you can make them thick. Let's have a look. Okay. Starting with an example of three-step equations. Here we go. And I will log in. Okay, so I'm obviously using specific examples from MathSpace here because that's what I know. Um, but this, obviously, the, the layers of adaptive learning could apply to any mathematical software. Okay, so looking at solving this three-step equation, solve minus 4x on 5 plus 1 is equal to minus 23. I'm going to go with the first step here of minus 4x on 5 is equal to minus 24. And then I'm going to submit that. And you can see here we've marked that step as they're going along. So this is the step level in a loop. The, as a student is working through a problem, we're giving them feedback as they're going through. If they were to get that answer incorrect, then they'd get that feedback that that's incorrect step. Okay, so this is the inner loop. More than that, we have that context sensitivity. So if a student doesn't know what they're doing now, they can ask for a hint. When they ask for a hint, take them back to their last correct step, the minus 4x on 5 equals negative 24, and it'll tell them what operation can we apply to both sides to remove the fraction. So the hint that's being given there is not a generic hint that's for every student. It's, it's context sensitive. It's given the step, the last correct step that they were on. And this is really where that, that inner loop comes in. Um, if a student still doesn't know what to do, we can provide a second hint. And in that second hint, we're more explicit. Multiply both sides of the equation by 5. And you can see we can also provide some scaffolding on how to get to that next step. And this is something that we've actually added later. Uh, we initially didn't provide any scaffolding, but we found that for a lot of students, the problem is not always the mathematics, it's often the reading. Um, and so adding that bit of scaffolding really gives a lot of extra context to the hint. So multiply both sides of the equation by five with the scaffolding, fill in the box kind of questions. Hopefully all students can get some success at that level. But if they still can't, um, they can skip a step. And they're actually shown that very next step. And this is important because for the students, um, certainly in the learning mode, and, um, uh, and MathSpace was really designed for a high school audience. Um, uh, it's being used at uh, tertiary level, um, but really the initial design was very much for high school and very much for a learning experience rather than assessment. So while a lot of um, teachers are now using it for assessment, instructors are using it for assessment, and I'll get into some of the modes that um, teachers can assign tasks in, uh, our, certainly our primary reason for existence and our primary aim and vision was to create a learning experience with MathSpace. Okay, so they can skip that step. And, and I guess the important thing about skipping that step is that we don't necessarily say it's an all or nothing approach. If you don't know how to do the very first step, but you can pick up from there and, and move on, then that's great. And I guess that makes a lot of sense in assessment as well, where you want to give students partial marks for getting part of the answer correct. OK, now I want to show what happens if a student was to take another path. Um, so we went down the, the, probably the, the obvious path of subtracting one from both sides. But if a student decided to first multiply everything by five, Uh, 
115, I think. So test my maths. There we go. Uh, then you can see that the, it's smart enough to pick up that that's correct as well. Okay, so they don't have to go down the, the obvious path, the particular path. Um, and that's really where some of the intelligence comes into that inner loop. Um, it's in equivalence marking that whatever path a student goes down, is the system able to pick up the, the correctness of that answer? Anybody who's, um, uh, I guess, worked with... So if, if you have used software that does this kind of step-by-step -step, um, marking and can give responses whether a student goes down a particular path or another path, this is what I call the inner loop adaptive feedback, and it's the kind of intelligent tutor system. Um, it's probably the most difficult part to, to actually build um, in software. Um, okay, now if a student was to now get stuck and not know what to do next, and I can ask for a hint, you'll see that the hint now is very specific to that step. What operation is needed to isolate the X? We must reverse the operation of adding five. And that's the context sensitivity of, depending on the student's path, we provide a hint for that student to go through. Uh, now, I will say that this um, isn't always the case. Um, what we try and do um, is to cover as all the paths that we think a student might take. So, but it's not smart enough to, that if a student was to you know, write an integral that has the same answer now that it would be able to pick that up. Um, it'll actually take them back to the last reasonable step that they entered and give them a hint from there. Um, and we've, de we've debated whether we should actually invest the time to um, try and make the system even smarter, that if a student was to do something strange like, um, let's say they were going to do something strange like, for some reason they wanted to add one to both sides. Don't know why they would. Uh, the system is smart enough to know, yeah, that's correct. And we've debated whether we should give them a specific hint for that case or not. And we actually felt that it's probably worse to do that. Um, it's probably better to say, no, go back to a reasonable step and work from there, rather than let's continue from this unreasonable step that you've taken. OK, so that's really the inner loop. And I want to show you one other example it's, uh, of that. I can get back to here. There we go. This is a geometry example. And I don't know if what's happening if it's happening in the UK but, um, or other parts of the world, but geometry seems to be getting removed from more and more from um, higher ed um, curricula, uh, which I think is a real shame. It's geometry's, I'm personally a fan of geometry and geometric reasoning. I think it's a great way to, to teach logic. Uh, but in any case, it's a, it's a really good example of showing um, that step-by-step -step level inner loop um, intelligent feedback. So here we're looking at a question, we need to find x, um, given those three parallel lines. Now, I want you to imagine what the very basic mathematics software uh, where it's a multiple choice question, if this was a multiple choice question, or just an x equals box. A student would look at this question, and they'd be like, OK, I need to find x. Um, x, I've got one angle, 123. So x can maybe be 123. Or I know there's something special about 180, um, and so x could potentially be 57, so it adds to 180. Um, and given that it looks acute, it looks closer to 57, I'm just going to go with that, x equals 57. And the student does that, and they say, correct, you understand geometry. When in actual fact, they have no idea about the geometry that's going on behind this diagram. So even math space, so if a student wants to say x equals 57, we say, you need to show another step before this step. OK, so sure, you've, you've got the right answer, but that's not good enough. We're looking for the, the reasoning behind how you got there, the x equals 57. And so they need to actually find another angle first. OK, now I'm going to leave it to, to you to tell me which angle would you like to find, because there's obviously multiple ways that you can prove that x equals 57. So any takers? BGD. 
All right, let's go with BGD. Angle BGD is equal to 123. Okay, and we don't enforce the degree sign. You can put it in or not put it in, um, which is, I know, mathematically, we really want them to put it in. But from a student perspective, it's super frustrating to have to click degrees every single time you want to do that. So we've, we're trying to find the right balance there. Okay, so we've done that. That's correct. Now it's time to give a reason. And what we do is we basically have a keyword search through the list of reasons. So from a keyword search, um, we know it has something to do with parallel lines. So we can start typing parallel, and then all the reasons with parallel come up. And we can type choose basically from their corresponding angles in parallel lines are equal. Okay, and I know this is different things in different um, parts of the world, they call it, but I'm pretty sure in the UK it's similar to Australia, you call them corresponding angles in parallel lines. So hopefully no one's surprised by the terminology there. Okay, so angle BGD is 123, great. Now that we've found that, we can now find X. And so now when we say X equals 57, it says correct, and what's your reason? So notice that over here, we have found this angle there, angle BGD. So obviously the reason to getting X is that angles on a straight line are supplementary, add up to 180. Now had we found uh, another angle first, so had we found instead um, we went with the green angle over here, um, and then we'd need the reason of vertically opposite angles. Um, so it's, it's sensitive to the path that the student's taken. So if I was, I'm going to try vertically opposite angles now as a reason, which could be a reason for X being 57, but we haven't shown that. And so when I enter vertically opposite angles are equal, it tells me that's incorrect. That's not the correct reason in this case because I have found BGD and so the reasoning I have to use is that angles on a straight line, angles forming a straight line are supplementary. And that is correct. So this is a really good example of that inner loop in, in action there. Um, it depends on the path that a student takes where the response, um, the correctness of the response depends on the path they took. So if, like I said, if a student was to first find angle, uh, if they were first to find this angle here, they'd need to use co-interior angles as their rule, and then they need to find vertically opposite angles to find that. If they were to find this angle first over here, then they'd say first that's because of alternate angles, and then they could find x by co-interior angles. All those cases are covered. OK. All right, so that's the middle, the inner loop. The middle loop is what happens after a problem. So students get served one problem at a time. Once they get that um, question correct or incorrect, um, it's what question do we serve them next. So generally what we try and do here is as the problems, uh, as students get them correct, we want to progress them to more difficult problems. As they get them incorrect, we want to take them back to simpler questions. Now all the questions that uh, digital assessment can um, serve up or, or randomize. Generally, all good software would randomize the, um, the numbers that, that are there. So you can actually forever generate more and more questions of the same type to get students familiar with the easy concepts before progressing into the harder ones. Um, we at MathSpace use item response theory. Um, a lot of literature about it um, as a way to uh, determine what the most suitable next question is based on the student's mastery. So feel free to read up on item response theory to get a sense of how that all works. Um, we, at this stage at MathSpace, we only take difficulty of the question into account, um, and we use two factors to determine difficulty. One is our in-house uh, math instructors, uh, maths, I can say maths here, maths instructors, um, who basically are they will actually sort the questions in terms of difficulty, so their personal rating on the difficulty of the questions. And the other is actually all the users that are using MathSpace. So we now have hundreds of thousands of users using MathSpace, so we get a lot of data points of uh, how many, of um, whether, which questions are most difficult. Um, and we use a combination of those two because we found that uh, 
we always want to keep instructor, um, you know, we don't want to go fully data driven um, in that sense and lose the value of instructors actually knowing what, what sequencing that question should take place. Okay. Um, so we'll take a look at an example of, of this in action as well. Okay, so I've chosen a, a subtopic here on expanding binomial expressions. Okay, and this is the, the very first question in the set. Um, and you can see it's really trying to lead question students into the concepts of expanding y plus 8 multiplied by y plus 9. Um, the very first part is what is the area of the rectangle A. Um, so you can see you have the y plus 8 and the y plus 9 over here. And we need to find the area of that rectangle first up. Okay, so I'm going to start with the student to hopefully everybody knows how to do this basic multiplication. Okay, the area of rectangle B, 8y, area of rectangle C, 9y, area of rectangle D, B72. Okay, and then use the areas of each to find the area of the whole rectangle. So we have y squared, oops, uh, plus 8y plus 9y plus 72. And of course, I can show the working out, and we hope that students do show their working out every step of the way. And then 8 plus 9, 17y. Cool. So we've got that question right. And you'll notice over here, I have achieved some mastery for getting this question correct. And I just want to show kind of the progression of the questions as we do this. So now that I've got that question correct, I move on to a slightly more difficult question um, with some scaffolding on how to do uh, an expansion. So I'll also get this one correct. 9 outside of t plus 2. OK. I got some more mastery and the questions. So every time after the question is done, algorithms churning using item response theory to work out what is the, mo the next be most appropriate question for this student to work on. Um, uh, some still scaffolding, but a bit less than before. Now they have to put in the whole second side expression. Again, I will get this correct, I hope. OK, and I'll get one more correct, and then I'll start making some errors. So now it's, all right, you're on your own. We've got you need some scaffolding. We can see that you've done that. You've achieved some mastery. Now you're on your own. Start working on binomial um, expansions. Uh, so we'll go with x squared minus 15y. And I should show my working, but I can do this all in my head, plus 36. This is what happens when you introduce a variable that's not part of the expression. <laughs> you introduce a variable y which is not needed. Don't sweat it. You haven't been marked wrong because a lot of students get super frustrated, so we have to remind them that, hey, it's OK. You haven't lost any marks for this. OK. That's the inner loop at work there. <laughs> OK. Back to the middle loop. The next question. OK. So now we're uh, really testing that the other way around. Do you know what that missing expression is? I'm going to get this one wrong. And the best way to get it wrong is to ask for hints, ask for another hint, still don't know what to do, ask for a next step. OK, it showed me the answer. Now, I got that incorrect. I didn't, get, I didn't get any mastery because I got that incorrect. Hopefully, I've learned something through reading these hints. And I didn't just click hint next step blindly like I did just there. Um, and then I move on. And now it's back to the simpler questions as I go through. And again, if I get these incorrect, hopefully with all this scaffolding, they're actually starting to, they won't get the whole thing incorrect. But the questions will start to get simpler. And now you can see it's kind of taken them back to a multiple choice question, getting them thinking again about expansions. So that's that middle loop in action. That's the item selection after every question. Um, progressively getting harder. So this achieves two things, really, um, for the students who are a bit slower and need more help. 
they can focus on doing more practice of those easier questions with different numbers and really consolidating their understanding. They can stick around those questions that have the scaffolding um, before they move on to working on the questions where we can remove the scaffolding slowly um, as they move on. For the students who know what they're doing, there's nothing worse than getting them to spend, you know, do work out 10 questions on, you know, the really simple stuff when they already know it. We can really speed them up to questions they already know, um, to questions through the stuff they already know so they can start working on that uh, in that sweet spot. Um, it's, there's some research done about this. Um, uh, they call this the, the zone of proximal development, which is where kind of the sweet spot where we want people to be. It's that area where they're not just, where they're not bored. Um, because they're working on things they already know and it's not where they feel too challenged because everything is just outside their ability. And that's really what we're trying to do with that middle loop is once we've honed in on the correct subtopic area that we want a student to work on, can we get them working for as long as possible in that zone of proximal development? And the, and the interesting thing is where these loops work, they work together. So it's, I think the best um, e-learning solutions are ones where the inner loop, the middle loop and the outer loop all work together and they're not working in isolation. So as an example of this, you can see the middle loop in action here of taking them to another question. Let's say that it's taking them to a question that's too difficult, but when that question is too difficult, the inner loop starts to help them with the step-by-step -step feedback. So hopefully that inner loop, they're actually learning something from that. When they get taken back to a similar question or a slightly simpler question, they've learned something and they can move on. So you can see the inner loop and middle loop are really kind of intertwined there. And I think that's really, in terms of what we want to achieve at, at MathSpace, what we think the, the future of e-learning is, it's in getting those loops communicating well with each other. Um, and there's so much more we could do there. We're only kind of just scratching the surface. Okay, so that's the middle loop. Let's check how I'm going for time. Go. Okay, I think we're, we're running, running well, I think, on track. We'll move with the outer loop now. So. The outer loop is really focusing on should they be learning this content in the first place? Are they even ready to learn binomial expansions? If they don't know how to multiply x by x, um, then they're, not, they're certainly not ready to expand binomial expressions. Um, so again, two things that are achieved there. Quickly identify, we want to quickly identify gaps in their knowledge to say, well, you're not ready to learn this. There's other content you need to learn first. Um, and the other extreme is the student who does already know it. We want to fast track them and say, well, there's no need for you to spend a lot of time working on um, binomial expansions, for example, when you're ready to learn calculus. Um, so those are kind of two things that we want to achieve. And I'll show you how that kind of looks like inside MathSpace. Uh, we'll take a, a look at the knowledge graph for fractions inside MathSpace. Okay. So. I'll make this smaller first so that you can't see anything. Um, this here is our knowledge graph for fractions inside mass space. Each one of those little things there, let's make it bigger, is a subtopic. A subtopic inside mass space is basically what you just saw with expand binomial expressions. That's what we call uh, a subtopic inside mass space. Generally, it's a set of 20 or so questions. Uh, 20 or so um, yeah, questions, each one with a kind of slightly different skill that it's assessing. So you saw it with binomial expressions. The very first question was one that had uh, the rectangles, the area of rectangles, and then we had some scaffolding, some where they had to do it backwards, some of the numbers got higher, some with negatives, etc. as you go through. So each one of these is that kind of maybe 20 questions um, that it's addressing. And so here it is for fractions. You can see that, for example, we got, we have Order and count with fractions. Now, after you've learned order and count with fractions, you can go to identify the value of fractions from area models or name, identify, and compare mixed numbers. Compare and comment on the size of fractions by relating to benchmarks. Add fractions relate to size of fractions. So you can see it's basically it's an order that we have here of how the skills should progress. And this is, again, similar to similar to what we had with um, the inner loop. Uh, the outer loop is done, two things inform that. One, a, our in-house mathematical teachers, our experts, who um, our content subject matter experts, who actually put these things in the correct order based on what normal mathematical development is. 
and two, using the data that we get from students, do students who master uh, identify the value of fractions from area models, um, do they normally go on to do well in compare the size of fractions using models? Okay, so those two things um, together. We don't actually use an algorithm to do any of this automatically. This is all, it, uh, we feed that data back to the subject matter experts and then they manually adjust this, um, the arrows basically, the direction of stuff based on the data that we're feeding back to them. So there are times where we get data that suggests that one thing should be before the other, but it doesn't make sense from a, a mathematics teaching perspective and so we, we always leave the final say to our content, our subject matter experts. Okay, so that's what it looks like for, for fractions. Okay, and you can start to get a sense of just how much mathematical content there is if this is just fractions. Actually, I've got a little visualization I might share with you to give you a sense of that. Okay. Here we'll, this is the same graph with early fractions. Okay, so again, each node might have 20 questions all with random numbers, and this is the kind of the, the shape of how students might progress through those skill sets. So this over here, for example, is order of fraction, order fractions by approximating their size to benchmarks. Okay, this is how it looks like when I add, uh, let's do early fractions and fractions. Okay, so I've added some more fractions. Just to give you a sense of just how much mathematical content there is, Let's throw in some early decimals. Okay. Um, let's look at the entire curriculum for... I want to look at all of it because it might explode. I'll look at like half of it. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, it's not very helpful, this visualisation. It's too big now. <laughs> but it just gives you a sense of the amount of mathematical content. And really... This is what a lot of good educators say. Um, say This is kind of what I think when I'm sitting next to somebody trying to teach in mathematics. It's, um, it's that one-on-one that one -on -one tutor. I, in my mind, I'm sitting there going, well, you can't do this question because there's actually all these um, subtopic areas that you don't know. And I try and identify where their gaps are and go back. And this is something that a computer can potentially do a lot better. Um, and really, this is kind of the... This is the grand vision for what we want to achieve at MathSpace and I think what digital learning in mathematics can look like. That every student is, has highly personalised instruction, getting the right question for them in the right um, topic area, um, right in that zone of proximal development. There's still a lot of work to do to get there, um, but these, I think, are the, the framework for achieving this is thinking about that inner loop, that middle loop and that outer loop, and then how those loops interact with each other. And this is really what we mean by the outer loop. Can we identify among all this mathematical landscape which node we should try and hone in on and then we can use the middle, the middle loop in there to get the right questions within that node and then of course the inner loop with the step-by-step -step feedback so that hopefully every student is engaged at exactly their, the right zone of proximal development. 